welcome to the Empathic Mastery Show. I'm your host, Jennifer Moore, and I'm so glad you're here. This is a place where we talk about what it means to be highly sensitive and empathic, how this impacts all aspects of our lives, and we explore tools, resources, and solutions so we can shift from absorbing all the thoughts, feelings, and energy of the world around us to being beacons for calm, love, and healing. Hey there, everybody. I am so glad to be back. And guess what? I have another interview with an amazing, highly sensitive and empathic woman who's doing incredible things in the world. So today I am bringing Lisa Campion on. She is an author. She is a psychic. She is a teacher. And Lisa is somebody who has a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge about, wait for it, psychic vampires and so I have never done a show about this incredibly important topic and I cannot wait to go into it but before we go into that hey there Lisa welcome can you just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about you and sure yeah yeah. thanks I'm so thrilled to be on your show this is a topic that's near and dear to me and I, I love it that you have a whole a whole podcast that's all about this topic it's beautiful so thank you for doing that and I've been um I've been working as a psychic since I was 19 it's uh way back in the day I know me too <laughs> really I know I, yes. I, I keep telling you we were separated at first uh-huh. um yeah you know yeah I started when I was 19 and I was really like one of those I see dead people kids and I grew yep. up just outside Boston in this 60s 70s and 80s and and, you know, of course, back then there were no psychics on TV, no new age bookstores, no beautiful podcasts like us <clears throat> doing things. So I really, you know, was just struggling to figure out what was going on, what was happening. There was no word empath, even though, of course, I was an empath. And I, I was just kind of trying to stay like fit in, nor, you know, pretend to be normal, fit in public, not end up in the mental hospital. And, you know, I grew up in one of those like mom up Victorian houses in Newton that was super haunted. Murphy's law, put the psychic child in the haunted room, you know, you know, so yeah. I was going, I, was going <laughs> I grew up in a stucco house in, uh, you know, you grew up in, in Newton, I grew up in Winchester, and I grew up in a, a stucco house built in the 1920s that definitely had some interesting energy. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. And fortunately for me, my parents were hippies. So mm-hmm. they took me to like transcendental meditation when I was 10. And I learned I met Maharishi, and he taught me how to me- meditate. And um, that was quite, I've had kind of an extraordinary um, spiritual, uh, you know, I've had some really lucky breaks, let's put it that way. And um, and I spent really the first 20 years of my life trying to figure out how to turn it off. Um, and then it was the 80s and I was in school, I went to UMass and um, Amherst, and it was then that was the dawn of the new age, thank God, mm-hmm, right? So mm-hmm. now there's books and teachers and things like that that are that are happening finally and and that's when I started working as a psychic and then I I trained became you know therapist and did counseling and therapy for a long time together and then 20 plus years ago I added Reiki into the mix and sort of work that way um doing all mashing all those things up into my sessions but these days I feel like my mission is to really train people to train psychics, healers, and empaths. I think we're going this, like, you know, people who's, who are psychics and empaths and have the soul of a healer are like waking up to their calling that this is what they're have. I feel like the world needs all the healers it can get. So we're, we're yes. in the nick of time. Like we need to train ourselves up and, and really kind of hit the ground running. So I, um, I think that my sweet spot is to train psychics, healers, and empaths to fully step into their gifts and live you know, and at their fullness of their potential, because the world needs all all the healers it can get. And my mission is to create an army of healers to go out and save the world, because it's we need it right now today, like it's happening. Um, And and that's what I like to do. And then I I've written a couple books, I wrote a book called The Art of of Psychic Reiki, um, which is psychic development and, and Reiki. And then this one came out this year, Um, energy healing for empaths Mm. which was my um my work with how how we set boundaries as empaths how we can live strongly as empaths and I do talk quite a lot about energy vampires and psychic vampires in this work because it's such a huge problem for empaths 
Which leads us to the topic, which is, so let's just start with, um, let's just, just to be sure we're all on the same page, let's start with what is, how do you define an energy vampire or a psychic vampire? And is there a difference between those two things? Yeah, I think there's a little bit of a difference. So energy, I mean, we've all, especially as empaths, had that experience where we're around somebody who just drains us, you know? Mm -hmm. who, I mean, I, I think that it's, fair enough to say we can sort of divide people into energy givers and energy takers. Mm -hmm. And that's just kind of a natural. Some people are just more, a little more on the giving side and paths always fall in that category. And some people are a little more, you know, on the taking side. Um, and when they often partner up, so they often kind of yes. choose, choose each other. And then when we get to the extreme, you know, the extreme edge polarities of these, you know, the edges of these polarities, we can have really an issue. So you might have somebody who's a taker that's just perfectly healthy and normal, but they just are a little bit self-absorbed, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, and, or then they get a little bit like more and it's like, well, maybe they have like narcissistic tendencies or not full blown narcissists, but they just have tendencies. Then we kind of cross the divide into sort of the the personality disorders like you get somebody who's really a full-blown narcissist or and then a psychopath you know is kind of that um most extreme version of that and um and that's sort of those are the energy vampires psychic vampires it's an interesting thing we can talk about that um too i hope we do and, yeah. and i've really kind of broken it i think there's a natural um coming together for for um empaths and energy vampires and when we're not dealing with the extremes there's potential for growth for both parties yes. so you know when we go into relationship with each other the um energy vampire will give the empath a lot of opportunities to learn to set boundaries mm -hmm. and it's a little bit like sink or swim like you're gonna you're gonna they're gonna force you kind of to set the boundary and we need to take a little step more towards them and psychologists, you know, in the middle, they call there's this thing called healthy narcissism, which mm -hmm. I just think is having good self esteem, right? So we come a little more towards them, and ideally, they come a little more towards us. They open their hearts a little. They they start thinking about how other people feel. They become a little more open and sensitive, and that is I see I see it happen sometimes with people with that relationship, and then sometimes it doesn't go well. Sometimes it's really you know, more polarized and, and there's more damage being done, um, in those super difficult relationships. And, um, and I do think there are, there's a few kinds of, I identified four different kinds of energy vampires. Um, Ooh. yeah. And so that's kind of fun to talk about. So the first kind is sort of what we think about. I think most people, it pops into their mind and that's like the super predatory nar narcissistic psychopath and we've all met one or two of them in our life and when we um they're very purposeful they're very like they will target you on purpose mm -hmm. and their goal is to sort of plug into you in every way they possibly can and literally drain your life force energy, your money, the gas in your car, the food in your fridge, your credit, your everything, every resource you have is their resource and they will suck you dry. And when you're no longer have anything, they toss you out with rather remorse, remorse yes. without remorse. And, and I've, I've seen this particular phenomenon a lot with um, where the things really go sideways is when the empathic woman married to a narcissistic energy vam or energy vampire man, when they have kids, that's when I've seen things really go sideways because no, the woman can no longer, or the, you know, the empath can no longer provide the kind of 24 seven attention and support that they are looking for. The other yes. thing that I was thinking about is that, you know, what's so deceiving a lot of times is the way they love bomb us at the very mm -hmm. beginning of that whole thing. So yeah. that by the time you realize that you're getting, you know, that's, that you're getting sucked on and drained, um, you know, you're invested. Absolutely. And they're incredibly psychic. So they yes. use their psychic ability to, to, figure out who you are in a very calculated way and they're mm -hmm. shapeshifters. So they're like, you know, sort of like method actors and they kind of like morph into being who you want them to be and like fill 
like every need you have, every desire you have. And I, I had a, a relationship like that. Um, and, and I'm, I mean, I'm pretty psychic. It's, it's hard to fool me. It's hard to like, you know, and this person totally, yeah, like yeah. the, the ultimate con artist they like become it's not just they're acting they like become they do who you want them to you know who you need and that in this like massively shape-shifty way until they hook you when when they get the hook in you then all of a sudden it's like you know and and it and all the manipulation and the gaslighting and the abuse and it's like they're going to get you to do what what um they want you to do kind of carrot or the stick like if the carrot doesn't work it's the stick and you know there's a lot of really really great information in the world right now about um from the narcissist abuse recovery community there's writers podcasts and if you feel like you've been in a hit and run with with a a predatory vampire like that you i you probably took some damage Mm -hmm. you probably need to recover it took me years like Mm. three or four years to recover from from mine and I was like super docked up my nervous system was shot I had like PTSD I was like a wreck so Mm -hmm. it Mm -hmm. took me a while of healing myself to kind of come out of that and it was actually that was a big part of the impetus I had about writing this book so you know we need to be I, I mean I we need to be mindful. Listen to your friends if they're telling you that someone's not good for you, because they may yeah. see it when you when you don't. And and you know, unfortunately, we do take pretty bad hit points. Um, yeah. We get yeah. we take damage points when we are in that kind of relationship. Well, and I, you know, the whole thing of I got to a place where I started to I made the decision to defer to my friends. Like before I got into a relationship, I made the decision to like let my friends vet somebody and check them out with a with perspective and not be like I decided to not get invested, like to hold back from investment, be, you know, without somebody else checking it out and going, "No, this looks like it's legit. This looks safe. This looks good. Go for it." It's really it. smart. You know, and I've been actually married to the same person for over 20 years now as a result of one of my best friends, like reading every single email that this person sent to me before he we even spoke on the phone. Like, because I knew that my ability to as an empath, sometimes it it's so hard to truly feel when somebody has that capacity to like psychically plug into us. And I actually think that one of the reasons why empaths and narcissists and psychic, you know, energy vampires get so attracted to each other is because of that feedback loop of when that they ever, it feels really good at the beginning because yeah. the M, the vampire is getting their needs met. And as the empath, we feel them getting their needs met and everybody's on cloud nine. It's like, it's like the pink cloud period and yes. it's great. And I think that's, what's so hard about it is that we get there and it's like, there's that moment of it's almost like you're far, you're well invested by the time you start going, oh, you know, whatever expletive you want to use, what just happened? So actually, I'm, yeah. um, I'm curious, like, you know, obviously, you went through this, like, what was the point where you went, uh oh, like, something is wrong here? This is this is not working. It was when when um, this person wasn't able to get what they wanted through the through the carrot and the stick came out and the stick was very ruthless, um, very cruel, very um, almost like the, with the feeling of violence behind it was mm. like a, a kind of a threat of violence. And um, when that when it when that didn't work on me, then then it was aimed at my kids, oh. you know, and I was like. I was like, went mama bear, right? you know, right. And, and that was like, oh no, 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 we're not, we are not having that. And, and I could just see it. I was proud of myself because it, when I was younger, I might've kind of fallen into that cycle of, you know, oh, he didn't really mean it. Or he was so nice afterwards, or, you know, kind of like what happens in sort of classic abuse relationships, um, but I, I didn't, I, I cottoned onto it as quick as I could and, and got out. Um, but even then it was, it was rocky getting out of it. It was wow. Um, hard. 
Well, and that's, you know, that's, that's one of the things that, you know, I touch on it in my book, um, you know, that like the challenge with getting out of or extricating from these kinds of relationships is you do need support and it can be really precarious and dicey. So actually, um, what are your, like, so for somebody who suddenly is like, oh, crap, I am in a relationship with a abusive energy vampire, a predatory energy vampire. What advice do you have for that place of when you realize that it's happening to the revelation or the realization that you need to, you know, extract yourself from it? Like, what advice do you have for how do we safely navigate this this period or this process? I feel like, um, like, I love what you said about support. So kind of collecting a team around you and, you know, getting a therapist or getting somebody to kind of stand witness. And, uh, and for me, it was like some of my friends who observed what was going on, you know, and, and there were times when I really was afraid. So I needed, um, and I, I don't know what I was afraid of, if it was just verbal abuse or violence, there was, uh, you know, um, I had a lot of fear. And so I needed, I needed to not be alone with that person. I needed to like, there to be space. Uh, eventually I needed a restraining order, honestly, you know, mm -hmm. to kind of like pull in like the, um, cause uh, sometimes they don't really like it. They're not going to let you go. Certain types of, of them can go stalker, yeah. um, which is what happened to me. Um, and some of them are done. There's as soon as the, you turn off the supply, they're like, bye. And they have no back. They just know backward. They're like, see ya. And they, move on so fast it's like head spinning yeah. um and that yeah. does happen sometimes but some of them just get very angry that you would you know they, they see you sort of as a possession like you can't mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. how dare you you know you're not getting away from me like that kind of thing and then it, you know all all the you know call on every resource around you to kind of which is what i had to do um to kind of nip that in the bud um and it, it actually took talking to the police in my town and just being like, look, I'm having this issue. Mm -hmm. And then they, they had a conversation with that person. And that was, you know, that was the end of it. So it kind of dropping the hammer down. And it, and I think because it wasn't me doing it, it, it solved the problem. Um, so it can be very, very challenging to get out kind of certainly without, without damage. And I worked with a, this woman, um, when I first really realized what was going on, it was years before I had this kind of relationship myself. I had this woman, she was kind of in her forties and she was so ill. She came, she was so sick and um, had such horrible life force energy. And it was, nobody could figure out what's wrong with her. It was like mystery illness. She'd come in every day, every week for Reiki and I'd kind of like plump her up and, you know, kind of reset her. And she'd have a little glow about her again. And then she, the next week she'd be like, you know, mm, and the, mm. when the penny, the penny drop for me is one time she was so ill, she couldn't drive herself anymore. And her husband came to pick her up and her husband came in and he looked like 10 years younger. She looked 10 years older than she was. He looked 10 years younger than he was. And he put his arm around her and I could see the energy cord like between them. You know, and it was like, you know, when you put your gas, when you put your, um, when you plug your gas into the, you, and you pump the gas, like, yeah. bloop, 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 like yeah, that's yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. what it looked like. Wow. Um, and, and I was like, oh my gosh, that's what's going on. Like it's, I'm filling her back up and with all this stuff. And then he's just, and finally she, I thought she was going to die. Quite frankly, I thought if she doesn't get away from this relationship, she's not going to make it. Mm. And eventually she um, ended it because she was sort of out. She had no more money. She was too sick to be of service to her, this husband. So he, he just left. She just left. He just was like, gotta go. And mm. like wandered off with her friend <laughs> and, and she recovered, you know, she recovered her health and her glow and she, she got totally got back on her feet. But that was the moment I was like, wow, like, look at this what's going on here. That was probably the most extreme 
case that I saw. You remind me of, I had back in the days where I was tattooing as a healing art, I would have, you know, people would come into, into my shop and do interviews with me and stuff, you know, like we'd have a consultation and stuff. And I just remember there were a couple times where um, the, 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 the narcissistic energy, energy vampire partner would show up. And there is a quality that you're describing that I know exactly what you're talking about, where I could feel their dominance and I could feel like it was like their energetic possession of that person. And like, I was having none of it. I'm like, I'm doing this piece for this person. You are out of here. But I could feel like I could feel their energetic will trying to control me. I could feel like the way. So it's like, it's not just about necessarily the 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 object of their desire or you know who they're feeding on but then also the way that they manipulate people around those people to yeah. reinforce it it's it's creepy you know creepy. i can it's really creepy it's really creepy you know so, isolate you you know they'll isolate you yes. from your from your friends from your family from your children from your support they'll isolate you from anyone who will kind of you know you know, be like, what are you doing with this person? And, you know, they're just going to, uh, to disempower you enough so that they, they can kind of keep you hooked. Well, and um, they're so good because yes, you were saying they're chameleons and they're so good at, you know, and psychically manipulating things and really, really like not, you know, that's the thing about, about the narcissist. I think the narcissist buys their own game so strongly that what makes it possible, what makes them undetectable for us as empaths and psychics is the fact that they buy their crap. Like they are completely invested in it too. I know they so believe it. They, they believe their own story. They believe their story so they can really snow people. So people are kind of like, oh, they really seem good. But you know, you, your comment about the manipulation the tech, you know, the ways that they isolate people, that they will get you isolated, that they will slowly but surely remove your, your, your support system and the structures that will keep you safe, yeah. that, you know, um, and I think I've definitely known women where it's like, it's an extrication process that can take upwards of years because it's like hiding a little bit of money, like slowly one little tiny bit at a time and finding resources and doing all of the things before it is possible to get out of there. Um, yeah. You know, because it is just, it is, it can be so, it's so subtle, so insidious, so challenging. All and the they're things. so they're often charming. They have like oh, tons of charisma. They're, they're attractive, charming. They're like the real vampire, you know, yeah. the real vampires. Like you know, the Hollywood vampire. Anyway, is like all the glamour, like the the glamour magic, you know, where they're yeah. um um they're they're so attractive and so charming. Everyone will be like, oh, that person is great. You know, what a you're so lucky. What a great per you know. And yeah. and then there's just a different. Thing that happens kind of in private and they they do tend from a energy perspective hook you right in the third chakra right in the mm -hmm, solar plexus mm -hmm. which is the chakra of our will yeah and they kind of chip away at your will chip away at your self-esteem compromise your will um you know that this chakra is the one that should t help us say yes or no like where we feel enough self-esteem to say no mm -hmm. and they they just like chip away and chip away and chip away until you you ha don't have much will left and don't have much self-esteem left you right, know right well and with them being regarded like with the all of that char charisma and all that glamour and especially if other people are like oh my god you're so lucky that person is just so wonderful there is a way that also like as they just continuously undermine your self-esteem where you can really be like, wow, how did I get so lucky to deserve this kind of a person? And like, I'm never going to be able to find somebody better than this person. And just all of the, and like you were saying, there are so many um, behind closed doors, like such subtle, subtle, um, and sometimes like not even verbal cues, but telepathic cues. Like you, when you were saying with your ex, that point where it was like you couldn't necessarily say whether you were just afraid of the verbal abuse or like some kind of emotional 
um, meanness or whether you had sensed another threat. And I was thinking that's because they probably never said the threat, but what they were doing was that they were beaming, they were telepathically broadcasting menacing energy at you yeah. where you knew that they were threatening, you know, that there was more at stake than just, you know, like using a few, calling you some nasty names. You exactly. Know? Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. That's such a good point, you know, and, and because they really psychically plug in yes. um, to us, and they're, they're, this is sort of where the psychic vampire comes in, which is psychic vampires, energy vampires take take your energy. Psychic vampires use a psychic connection with you to manipulate you on the inner plane, you know, on the psychic level, and may come through your dreams or may come through like that telepathic stuff you were talking about, um, that where it's going to be on the subtle planes rather than overtly, right? And and it's super important when you're clearing a relationship like this to do cord cutting, to mm -hmm. do, you know, to, to um, really disrupt any of those lingering energetic cords because the psychic vampire can continue to feed on you long after the relationship's broken up and you'll have nightmares about them or dream about them or you'll, you know, before I cleared the cords, I would sort of wake up shaky in the middle of the night and feel like that person was standing in the room, even though he was long gone, you know, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it, it's sort of like an astral projection in a yeah. way of like their, their astral force coming in um, and still spying or siphoning energy. And that's really what psychic vampirism is more about, you know, that, and because they're the predatory, type energy vampires so gosh darn psychic it's really easy for them to do that well and so i'm imagining also you have people who are both energy and psychic vampires where they're you know there's a bit of yep. both i was also thinking about you know the whole thing of when i was younger having dreams about other people and having people show up in their dreams and especially if it's like i was like you know i'll say oh my god i dreamed about you last night and they're like i dreamed about you too that for me there's a yiddish term called beshert which means you know destined to be mm -hmm. and i you know for me that was a sign that it was beshert like i would i would you know if if like that kind of information came to me i would see it as like oh <gasps> we're meant to be. And now I would see it as a, you know, like a kind of like, huh, how the hell did they breach my, did they breach my, my, my fortress and get right. in? But back then it was more like a, oh, we, we must be soulmates. We must be <laughs> you soulmates. Know? Yeah. And I, um, yeah, one of the last sort of really precarious relationships that I, I, it was a bullet I dodged and I'm just like, thank you, God. It was a situation where I, extra I extracted myself and once the source was cut off, they just completely like disappeared and did not persist or stalk or any of those things. But I just look back and I think about some of the things that were happening that I sort of took as like, <gasps> spiritual evidence that we were supposed to somehow be together and now i'm like those were red flags like mm. this guy even though i'd never even met him before he had found he had an image of me on his computer from my tarot deck as a screensaver and he called the image that was of me his goddess and at the time because it was like he was like yeah i found this image of you know like i send bots out to find images and they come back to me and i just have this collection of images and this was my thing you know i was like oh my god we were we found each other in hindsight, I'm like, uh, that is some creepy shit. <laughs> like, and, and, you know, and, and thank you, God. Like I said, I was really lucky. He was one of those people where as soon as the source got cut off, as soon as the feeding was done, he was long, he was out of there. But I think the thing for those of us who are empathic is sometimes that romantic part of us can get sucked into things and can interpret things in uh, like like we want it to work we want we to we want to be loved and we, when they start love bombing us we can we can really get we really in. can buy it and yeah i have two chapters in my book on 
of love, one, one on love, empaths in love, and the yeah. other about sex, actually, because I feel like we're extra oh. vulnerable, you know, in our sexual relationships. And I wrote yes. a whole chapter on it because yes. I, 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 nobody's talking about it, I think, enough because we're super prone to being, you know, vamped when in our sexual encounters, you know, and, and there's such intermingling of energy that we need extra protection. But in my chapter on empaths in love, I talk about how um, deeply empaths want to be in relationship and we're really quite good at it. We tend to be a little codependent, but we have to kind of work through our codependency issues, but we have, we're, we're really old souls. And yeah. so we have like a strong need for the soulmate, strong need for um, a strong desire for for meaningful partnership, for deep relationship and intimacy. And I think a particular craving of this idea of soulmate, of soul recognition. And some people, like non-empathic people, can sort of date random people and just, I found a nice person on match and it's working, you know? And, and empaths really need to feel this deeper soul level connection. So we get very like hooked into this idea of soulmates and, and a little bit too much of the Disney version of soulmates and the you complete me version of soulmates like you know and we we ha we're vulnerable we have a vulnerability yeah. to the yes. concept of soulmates um a, the distorted ver version of it um and 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 that it's just if you know if a energy vampire figures that out and it's kind of like oh baby you're my soulmate and then they morph into that um, and all of a sudden they turn into Jamie Frazier from Outlander or whoever you want them to be. It's, it's like, you're, 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 you don't have a prayer, like you're sunk, you know? Yes, absolutely. And I love that you started, you've hinted at the aspect of sex and empaths. And, you know, I mean, that's one of, when I was younger, and especially sort of growing up in the kind of like the women's liberation, you know, like women's empowerment, like you can't tell me what to do with my sexuality stuff. I found the whole idea of like waiting to have sex kind of like, you know, polit like a political agenda, and kind of like, you know the heck mm. with that but the older i've gotten the more i really understand that like the challenge as empaths in my experience is that once you've had sex you've woven energy with another person and if and you're sunk because yeah. like you lose the capacity to discern whether somebody once you've had sex you're invested and we don't have the ability to just like like have a casual sex and walk away no. from it we can we don't and and we become intoxicated by it. So it's like, for me, my thing is, I fairly feel like all bets are off once sex is included in the equation. So I'm a strong believer in get, like, wait, give yourself enough time to find out who that person really is before you do something that is going to blind, like, like intoxicate you to who they are. But Absolutely. That's my, I love so, that. Yeah. That's so totally good. Please say more about empaths and sex. Well, I, I agree with you 100%. Like, empaths do not do casual sex very well. And, yeah. and it's, it's the ability to sort of shut down or, or shut your heart down. You know, it's, we're going to just open our hearts very deeply in our, in our sexual relationships. And when we're in a relationship where we're loved, honored, revered, you know, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And when we're not, when we're being dishonored or it's, it's, there's harm, it's like too casual, then it it's sort of like the, the fastest way to hell. It's like heaven or hell, you know, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. when, when our sex, sexual encounters and because we're so receptive in the way that we receive energy and um, we're literally receiving body fluids from other people. And um, those body fluids are, incredibly psychically charged yeah so they have like intense psychic imprints in them and so when we it's like even just this non-sexual touch for an empath will give us a huge amount of feedback from that person but if that if we're swapping body fluids with somebody else in all the ways that we do that um we're we're literally receiving this like intense you know absorbing really absorbing this intense we, um, amount of energy and sometimes it's not very good energy if they're not loving us if we're not in loving relationship if it's disrespectful or casual or like 
meh, you know, like if they're a selfish sort of narcissist and they're in it for them and they're not in a caring space for us. Um, uh, and I find too that people release a lot of um, psychic detritus in the um, course of an orgasm or mm-hmm. releasing again, mm-hmm. body fluids. So we, we absorb that not only the essence of them, but whatever they're releasing. That's why we feel so clear, why our energy fields are so clear after an orgasm, after sex. It's tremendously clearing to the field, but where's all that stuff going? Well, it's going into your partner. And um, if it's, and so we, we need to learn to either, we need to learn to consciously transmute that energy, um, which we can do as sort of a tantric practice. Yeah. Um, and, or we need to just be so mindful so um to respect ourselves and love ourselves be super careful who you you share that kind of energy with because it's we're we're really deeply deeply um intermingling our energy with other people in that case so we have to we can't just casually do it i'm i've I've like done so many clearings on empaths where I'm just clearing out all this residual energy that they've you know collected from their partners that they haven't cleaned or don't mm-hmm, know how to. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, and as you're speaking, I'm thinking about two pieces of this. Is one is we are literally taking their DNA into our bodies. That's right. Literally taking our the DNA into our bodies. And I think I had read something a while back that was basically saying that like every single lover you've ever had sex with or encountered, it's like that DNA leaves a like a residue, an energetic like you you hold the DNA of these other people in your body like in perpetuity but then i was also thinking like okay so if i have the dna of all of these like lovers from from various points in time it's like whoa (laughs) that's kind of creepy but um the other thing i was thinking is like what is the ramifications of all of the children conceived in these like psychic energetic vampire releases like you know i mean especially for uh, you know, for for a baby to can be conceived through, you know, men like orgasm and ejaculation are kind of not necessarily one in the same, but fairly interconnected. So you can kind of imagine like how many people are conceived with the like the forward of all this detritus, all of this debris, all of this energetic stuff that is being like released, like. What kind of legacies? I'm just thinking even in terms of like ancestral legacies and, you know, how we inherit trauma. I'm like, well, yeah. I mean, if if the way we're conceived is that all there's this download of information going into the generally the the mother, like what does that mean for the children and for the descendants? I mean, sure. It means a lot. I mean, you know, when we are conceived in love it has a, a gigantic imprint, you know, on who we are. And when we're not, we're in lust or need or attachment or dominance or all the other reasons, you know, people engage in sex. Um, it's going to have an imprint, I think, of that energy right right from the get-go um, that would have a significant impact on you, on your being as you're developing, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Wow. The ramifications of this are just incredible. Oh, man. Um, So you mentioned that there are four types of energy vampires, and we touched on the very first, and, and then, you know, all of these amazing pieces of the conversation came from that. But so you mentioned, you know, the first type of energy vampire is the predator or the, mm. you know. So what are the other three energy vampire types? The other three, there's the victim type vampire which i feel like is much more common yes. um and less overtly damaging to us mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. and and the victim is like people who just learn they're sort of more the, on the taker category and they've just learned a, a, a methodology of surviving in the world which is a kind of playing to the, their victim card um in order to hook or manipulate um uh, other people to get them to do their bidding kind of and uh, and i'm not saying they don't generally have true truly that had things that happen they have health issues they have mental health issues they have addictions they have i don't know they have, they have problems we all have problems you know yeah. and they, yeah. they do 
have those things. It's just, and I'm not diminishing what happened to them in any way. I just think that some people have used to learn that kind of as currency, really. Absolutely. And so they're they're like playing on that. Um, and they, they tend to use guilt, um, at, you know, sh- as a manipulation or shame. Like, I carried you for nine months in my womb. Like, now you owe me like, whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. That kind of thing. And they, they're sort of more physically and energetically draining. Like, you just are going to want to, like, take a nap. You're just going to, like, want to lie down and be like, Oh, clunk, you know, yeah. when you've been around them. And some of them, most of them in my like empirical, like I didn't study this, it's just observational, kind of not empirical, but um, most of them don't know they're doing it. Mm-hmm. Don't do it on purpose. It's just yeah. sort of a, they're just hustling and trying to get through the day best they can kind of. Um, and then there are a few that are really consciously, are they're like, you know, they've, they've, they're more savvily doing it. Um, and, I would almost with- say those are those are almost like wolves in sheep's clothing, where it's like they're really predatory vampires, you know. But they but they're using the victim vampire mask to yes. manipulate something. But yeah, yeah. If you're describing them. I, it's funny. I can think of four people that I'm like, oh yeah, I know. Yep, yeah, that's, that's they get on the phone. They have the same problem they always have. Always. They want to talk for an hour. Yeah. They just complain and whine. They don't take your advice because they're not actually invested in cha- changing. No. They're a little addicted to their drama trauma. Yeah. Um, and they're just like, blah, 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 blah. An hour, same story you've already heard a million times. And then yep. they're like, oh, I'd love to talk about you, but got to go. Right, you know? right, right. Um, or you start talking about you and they're like, oh, and like, I got to go. go. Gotta go. Yes. Yeah. Well, and the other the other thing I've noticed about these kinds of vampires is that they have absolutely no insight that there is. It's never about them. It's never their responsibility. It's never their own behavior. It's always that the world sucks, that this has happened to them and that mm-hmm. there is there is never that part of them that's going, why do I keep attracting to th- this? Why is this continuously happening? Or um, uh, there's one person um who who always if we say anything um their answer is oh i know i know i know i've already done that and it's like you haven't done shit honey <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah right no not happening yeah there's but- no real investment in change or growth or introspection None. or like None. or owning their own mm-hmm. taking responsibility for their own life in any way really in any any way at all so yeah it, that's why i called them the victim vampire because yeah. they really are super entrenched in that um, victim identity and really like Carolyn Mace wrote a great book about it called why people don't heal mm. um, and she kind of coined this term woundology as you know how people are um, are used that wound as their currency fantastic yeah. book yeah um, so the, with those ones really we just have to set a boundary yeah and you just are going to decide you're going to talk to them for 10 minutes you're going to visit them it's a relative or somebody you can't quite cut out of your life. You, you just have to have really serious limits. You're going to have a, you're going to call them when you have 10 minutes in the car and then you got to go, mm-hmm. you're going to visit them for an hour, you know, yeah. and boom, it's done. And, and that's really the only way if you, if you, if you really need to stay in relationship with them, that's the way to handle that. Um, and then, the, then there's a situational vampire, situational vampire. So I've, they're really like any ordinary person who just falls upon very, very difficult times. And we all have, can have like a catastrophic illness or loss of bereavement or a pandemic, you know, or whatever just like brings us in. It's it's a temporary thing where we we're so um, we're so at the mercy of what's ever going to us that we don't have anything to give and we mm-hmm. just need a lot, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know? And that, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I think that anyone can, I know th- there's times in my life where I've been that, you know, um, and hopefully we turn it around. Hopefully yeah. we pass through yeah. that. Hopefully we receive and then we figure it out. And when we're feeling better, we give back to yes. the the people that help sort of get us through that difficult time. Um, and I, I don't know. That's just, 
it's just the way it is down here on planet earth sometimes right yes yes well and when we've been so completely depleted that we become a void there is that point where it's sort of like there's just that almost like vacuum of energy you know that sucking energy of just like like there's nothing left and I, I can think of people where I could, you know, like where I'm like, this is a person who is just has nothing to give. They are so depleted. And I will say I tune in and I'm like, I know they need and I'm willing to give. Right. And and that's that for me is a really different thing. But but where I think it's the fascinating thing is like where the where that point where they get the tank filled up enough again that they don't have to be a situational vampire anymore or, you know, like then it's the question of do they perpetuate it? Do they persist? Do they keep draining people or do they, do they turn it around? Yeah. I mean, I think hopefully they, they get the point and they, um, they give back. So, yeah. you know, they do some en- energy exchange in the opposite direction, but I think the the last kind of energy vampire are, the the ones and I when I'm talking to the empath community I always want to say let me hold your hands before I say this but um it's empaths themselves yes, who... yes thank you <laughs> thank you I am so glad we're having this conversation yes you know and it, it's like if you think about how baby vampires are made in the Hollywood version of the legend is you the vampire comes drains the life out of some person and then that person becomes a vampire. And so when we get so drained, if we've had like an energy vampire on us or we're drained by the world or we don't know how to manage our energy and everything's taking, we can become so depleted that we are the biggest energy vampire in the room. And I've done a lot of workshops in this on this topic over the years. And it's 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 the drained energy it's the drained empath who is the biggest energy vampire in the room and has no idea that they're even doing it. Mm-hmm. And they're usually the one they're they're like energy vampires, you know, they're they're sort of the ones that are carrying on and on about how horrible energy vampires are, but not really realizing they might be the biggest. They one. might be that. Well, and I I had a realization a very long time ago that the that there is a much finer line between empaths and vampires than anybody wants to admit. Yes. Because it's the same mechanism. Our capacity to pick up and absorb feelings and thoughts and energy and all the sensations from the world, we're still taking energy in and we're still absorbing it. And that mechanism, I mean, the vampires will deliberately feed on people, but as empaths, we are still in that position of we're taking, we're siphoning energy off. Usually, though, what we do is we siphon off the pain, the suffering, the challenging stuff so people feel better when they're around us because we've siphoned off the challenging stuff as opposed to the energy vampires who learn how to siphon off the good stuff. The good stuff. But I know for myself that a really big part of my work and my personal recovery around being a responsible empath as opposed to a hot mess empath had to do with owning the part of me that was absorbing people's energy and was continuing to absorb energy once I had a choice about it. And, you know, because I do believe there's, it's one thing to feel somebody's intensity coming at you and go, whoa, that is something really powerful going on for that person. It's another thing to then climb into their energy body, to psychically probe, to ping, and to try to get a feeling, like to, to like go that one step further and to like read somebody's mind or to be like, well, I can do this. And I know of empaths who, who actually like take a little bit of pleasure in, you know, energetically manipulating or pushing back. So I love that we are talking about this and that you are calling it out and saying, look, you know, there's, it's not necessarily one or the other. Sometimes it's both and. Exactly. Yeah, totally. You know, and and I, I, I feel like what our potential is, is to fully own all of that. Like you said, to own the part of us where we can vamp, where we can invade, because empaths are boundary invaders, you know, yes. they're, you know, really like um, 
oftentimes that kind of like, oh, let me get in there and feel you can feel really invasive to people who don't, who don't want that. Right. And so I feel like our potential and what I want, and I, I've seen a lot of empaths, their lives get smaller and smaller and smaller because they're, they're so crushed by the difficulties and the burdens of unmanaged sensitivity that they, they, they're like, well, I can lie on the couch and want ne- not watch Netflix and I can go walk my dog, but that's it. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. and what I what I want is for us to see our emotions as our superpower, and yet we need to be emotionally regulated because we're not off it. So we can be extremely emotionally dysregulated, and that's yes. an issue. And yes. it's it's our issue. It's nobody's business to deal with your emotional state except for yours. And we need help. We need therapy. We need healers. Skills. We need skills. But we can't expect the world to cater to our emotional temperaments, right? Right, we need to right. be fully in charge of that. We need to be fully in charge of our energy, of our boundary. Nobody can or should do it. It's no one's responsibility but you to manage your own boundary. Everyone in the world has a vested interest in you having a terrible boundary and overgiving, mm-hmm. you know, and and we need to be in charge of our energy exchanges in all the ways that we do it. And when we are, we can be masterful. This is where we become like the map, you know, like the ninjas, like the, you know, Jedi knights, you know, who can, whose function it is to serve humanity, to be as work as healers and caretakers, because I think that's our ultimate function. Um, and and then we can walk through the world with a lot of strength and power and mastery. That's what I want for all the empaths, not to be on the shadow side of crushed and victim and burdened and and truly, you know, um, you know, just kind of crippled by yeah, yeah. Um, our sensitivity and we it's all in our, our inside of our own self so that was sort of my goal with the book um was to help get people out of that crippled state and into the fully empowered state because that's a beautiful thing to see an empath fully holding their power that's spectacular mm-hmm. absolutely well and when we are in that place where we're like you know stop the world i want to get off staple hand to forehead like just world-class awfulizing i think what happens too is that we are not part of the solution we are contributing to the problem because we are just adding to the static we are adding to the noise we are adding to the pain we're amplifying the pain yeah and we're and and we're not helping and what I know is that if I am sensing discomfort and I can recognize it with that emotional mindfulness and I can re-regulate my own system and calm my nervous system down then I can serve as a beacon and an anchor for that calming energy that the world needs so desperately right now whereas an un when we're unconscious or being sort of emotionally irresponsible and and kind of bleeding emotionally, bleeding out emotionally all over the place, we are not helping. And, you know, I, yeah, we're not helping. And I do think like, yes, you know, even just thinking about it, it's like, as you were saying, like empaths being like the fourth kind of vampire, I also think that there's a fair number of empaths who get sucked into the victim vampire because yeah. it's just like, it's so hard. But I I really, you know, I had a an experience with somebody many years ago where it was like we were talking about how they were working with a work colleague who was incredibly um, abrasive and kind of challenging, not an easy person to be with. But this person who was working with them had a history of a pretty serious child abuse. And so they were very hypervigilant and they were always like on guard. But what they kept doing was because this person was kind of like silent and brooding and kind of had a menacing energy, they energetically were constantly probing and pinging this guy. And so this guy was like had would every time the empath would ping him and probe him and try to figure out what was going on. His hackles would go up and he'd turn into even more, like he'd get even more like on guard and like get the hell away from me. And it became this sort of vicious cycle where their fear and concern, but also they're like, what is this person doing was actually making the whole thing even worse. And I think that 
that's something we don't talk a whole lot about. Like I see so many places where it's like, oh, poor empath, you're having such a hard time taking on the worries of the world. And yet we're not talking about personal responsibility and we're not talking about, yeah, uh, don't go there, little buckaroo. Like, right. no, like, like we have, a, we do have choices. I love that you said that. And I, I feel like that we are hypervigilant as well, you know, and a lot of us use our empathy and, and did as small children sort of have to send these tendrils out into the world, out into our yes. family. Is mommy yes. safe today? Is daddy safe today? Like we had, yes. so we, I see them like, like tentacles that come out of the back of the second chakra in yeah. um, an empath that are like, pro, like doing that. It's the same hypervigilant probe Yes. You know, am I, am I going to be safe? Are you okay? If, if I don't know that if you're okay, um, I might not be okay. And it's so hardwired into our nervous system that kind of, and like we can grow up in like very unpredictable families or alcoholic families or whatever, all the, the shenanigans that, that, are, that are out there in the families. And that's our kind of thing. So mm -hmm. when we continue to do that, other people perceive that rightly as in, invasion. Yeah. And, you know, kind of like, get your tentacles off me. Like I'm fine, you know, like, or whatever. And, and if, if that man had had a boundary violation and he's perceiving that another boundary violation, of course, it's going to, you know, it's not, like you said, it's, it's not adding to it. So I, I do feel like we need to come. And I, I also noticed that what triggers an empath the most is the, when they absorb the feelings of what inside of them hasn't been healed yet. So if you have yes. a lot of unprocessed grief, then you can't be around. It's the people that have unprocessed grief. You can't be around because it rings your bell. Yes. Yes. You know? Yes. Yes. Well, and one of the things that I say over and over again is that as empaths, we feel better when other people feel better. And, you know, and so we have that that urgency to rush the rush to rescue and to fix so frequently is coming from the fact that if we have unfinished business, if we have wounds and trauma and triggers inside of us of stuff where we can't sit with the desolateness, we can't sit with the with the incredible grief we can't sit with the with the 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 fear or the wound that happened in the past because we've not cleared it ourselves then we are going to want to make it better for the person who resonates that same thing absolutely and that's I, where the codependency comes yep, yep, yeah i'm not yeah. okay if, unless you're okay so i'm going to make you okay so i can be okay and right. then it's sort of this double it's this double dipping double whammy thing where we have to feel all their feelings, then we have to feel all our feelings about their feelings. Well, and so now we're going to stop them from having any feelings. So we don't have to feel our feelings about their feelings. Like, well, and, and then the irony of how so often the empath is the designated feeler in the family system and is the yeah. one who is like picking up on what's going on around the family. And then you've got the person who's not owning their feelings, who's saying, you're making shit up. You're like taking this too personally, like get over it. No, what, you know, what ghost in the closet are you talking? Like, that's not real. And, and yet it's really <laughs> ironic because in a lot of ways, everybody doesn't want to feel what they're feeling. The empath maybe feeling it and saying it and expressing it but but it's like that sense of urgency or discomfort is still coming from the fact that night no none neither people nobody wants to be feeling their feelings right yeah i totally get it you know for me like the more i cleared my own channels and moved on my own inner work and inner child work and shadow work and all the hairy bits you know um, I, and I'm less reactive. I just don't react to people. I can sit and just, and stay calm and stay present, truly present, you know, with somebody else who's having a thing and don't feel like it's, it's an assault on me. It's just a person having a thing, you know? Um, and, and that it's such a relief. I, I feel like it's so, 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 so important to, for empaths to do their inner work. And I also, feel like sadly that empaths often get triggered for a uh, targeted for abuse at a higher rate than non-empathic mm -hmm, children do, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know? So if a predator is looking for somebody, somebody to prey on a child, they're, they may well pick the empathic child over the non-empathic child. So I think we have our, our more than our fair share of trauma 
Yes. Generally yes. speaking. Um, and then though, you know, when they're not resolved, that leads to depression, anxiety, addiction, and all the emotional things that we, you know, wounds that we have to contend with. Um, so I feel like it's super, 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 super important if you uh, to do the inner work and heal up our own traumas and our own unprocessed trauma and unprocessed emotional stuff so that we can regulate our emotions and um, and not be so reactive to the fl- stuff that's flying around the world. Mm. Mm. Abs- oh, everything you were saying, I'm just like right there with you, sister, like <laughs> everything. So totally, totally. I just, yes, 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 yes. And I just, and, and it's funny because I think about like what makes it sort of like, you know, just that whole thing of like our empaths may, are our empaths more vulnerable to the experiences or are, are the experiences what make us more empathic? Maybe it's kind of a combination of the two. But I just think about like, of course, an empath or a sensitive child is probably going to be the target more so than the impervious child, because it's like, there's not like energetically, if you've got a kid who's just like, what like I was interviewing somebody the other day and we were talking about how they have this child who is just like they asked them you know, do you ever deal with bullying and the kid was just like bullying like no like but it was like who's gonna child, bully me who's gonna bully me like it, it, some somebody would dare to bully me and it was like this kid's sense of self their core self-esteem is so strong and they're so and they're just so solid that it's like there wouldn't nobody would get anything out of bothering these children and i think that you know when you have a sensitive like flinching is like people get off on flinching like there's that because that, that's an energy energetic exchange that starts to happen and it becomes a cascade so yeah, yeah. I think, sadly i think you're 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 right on there that 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 it, sensitive children are far more likely to take hits i think so too and i i have sort of an even more radical theory on this that i i don't talk about very often but i'll bring it out here which is that the perpetrators are drawn to empathic children because empathic children are by nature healers at the mm-hmm, soul level mm-hmm. maybe they're in their twisted distorted way looking for healing maybe in their twisted distorted way they're looking for someone to get how they feel yeah and for someone to feel what they are doing yeah you know all of those sort of permutations of it where you would i love the term impervious as opposed to empath that's pretty cool so as opposed to the impervious child where it's sort of like going to be like bouncing a tennis ball up a brick wall right yeah um and and so i think that all of those uh reasons create a you know stronger likelihood that an empathic child would be targeted for for that kind of abuse and then you know then we have sort of a life lifetime of work in front of us of recovering from it you know and and you and the other thing too, like the the light side of that is moving into kind of the wounded healer um, archetype, which I see a lot of wounded healers since I train. I've been training healers the past twenty five years, um, and they they've just been through the worst traumas ever. You know, when they do their recovery work, they make the best healers. Yes, because they're so they're so there isn't any place they don't understand. There isn't they have deep 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 compassion. And they're like, oh yeah, I totally get it. Like I'm, I'm, I can go there with you. Um, and so, you know, for me, it's a little bit of the silver lining or the 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 pain to purpose kind of um, motivation that our the dark things that happen to us can lead to um, our purpose in some way. You know, absolutely. The one thing that that occurs to me that I would add as a caveat to this is that. We have to do our own work before we are going to be good healers. And I see so many people, and especially as the industry gets, and especially as sort of more and more people um, become uncredentialed healers and the industry gets less and less regulated in a lot yeah. of ways, um, that there are a lot of people who like do like a Reiki class or like start doing their own healing journey and put their shingle up a year or two years into their own process. And where 
it's sort of this thing of like, because they've had a taste of it, they're like, I'm going to become a healer now. And I do think that the one thing I would say is sort of like, I would, I would hold up is it is imperative. If you want to be a good healer, you have to do your work. You have to be willing to look at the dark stuff. You have to be willing to look at the places where you're like, that is the thing I don't want to touch. It's like, you need to be willing to touch the stuff because yeah. in order to truly support somebody in healing and not get into that codependent rescue phase, we absolutely must be able to hold space for incredible discomfort and not get triggered by it. And if exactly. we have not done our work, we will not be able to do that work. We will not be able to help other people to move through it. We'll get stuck in the trigger loop. And I think, yeah. unfortunately, there are a lot of people. And now it's like with so many of the resources that are available where somebody could like sign up for like a Udemy class and call themselves like a, you know, an EFT practitioner or something that there are places where they're not necessarily even getting the boundaries or the support of or the ethics no. or I the see ethics. A lot, see a lot of really like healers who have no concept oh. about the ethical oh. obligations they have or the responsibilities they have. That's a pet peeve of mine. Yeah. Um, and I go deeply into ethical training when I train healers and I, I have a year long program to train people to be psychic healers. And we do all of that. We do. I didn't, a clinical we do a practicum we do a supervision we do clinical experience we learn we do inner child work we do shadow work we do it all and it's the the healer that has the done the most inner work is the one that has the line out the door because our clients feel it instantly they get on your table and their subconscious feels instantly if they're safe with you or not and if you're still reactive and if you're still in your own shit you know too much then um you know and and I also see because people are generally unsatisfied with the traditional medicine and psychiatric worlds that we live in, people who have really serious trouble problems are seeking healers. So if you're going to be yes. a healer, you better be prepared to deal with somebody who has depression, serious mental health issues, addictions, loss, bereavement, uh, trauma, 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 and, <laughs> and you, karmic, ancestral, that, personal, all of, the all of it, right? Yeah. <laughs> and you better know how to deal with it because, yes. you know, and so that's what I teach in my, I mean, I've, you know, I've had so many hours of clinical work and my publisher, my publisher made me count 15,000 sessions that I've done in the past 20 years, you know, like, a, like why well, I, I have a huge amount of clinical practice as well as having been trained, you know, to be, to do therapy. So, so that's what I teach. I kind of a crash course on how are we going to, um, how are we going to do that? Because it's terrible. It's a terrible feeling to be one of those newbie healers and just be in a session where you're like, oh my God, I'm totally in over my head. Yes. I have no idea what to do with this person who is suicidal or who's addicted or who's whatever, has some horrible entity on them. <laughs> like, you know, all the things that we actually, that actually show up in our sessions mm -hmm. on the daily, like mm -hmm. that's a daily, that's a weekly, that's a normal week for me, all those things, yeah. Yeah. you know, and we have to know, so we, it, we can learn. We And I think to be a little humble you know to have some humility oh, and mm -hmm. just not think that you're maybe a reiki master after 12 hours of tra reiki training or something like you know like like to keep learning it's a lifelong thing and at to your point not only do we have to continue to do, do our inner work but never stop yeah like please don't ever stop doing your work it's like that that's where you get things get really good is when you're just always on the cutting edge of your own healing work, always on the cutting edge of like what, what, what's coming up next, because you will get it. You know, your issue du jour will be cut. What will be your five clients that week. And, you know, when we lean into that, we can have sort of this beautiful experience of our own unfolding, our own healing that we then can bring to our people. Absolutely. Uh, preach sister, like, mm. you know, word every, every single word that you are saying just so, so, so true. And, uh, you know, just so, so good. Lisa, this conversation has been so incredibly rich. I know that you and I could talk for hours and hours and hours and then more hours. <laughs> like this is, it's just been 
so, so good. And I just love, you know, how you've laid out the distinction between psychic vampires and energy vampires, the four different aspects of, of energy vampires, and then really talking about the elephant in the room, the fact that we as empaths can be vampires. This conversation and, and I mean, talking about sex and empaths, hey, you know, what a fantastic, fantastic conversation we've had. This show has been incredible. So as we're sort of rounding up towards the probably like we've probably even possibly rounded over the top of the hour at this point in time, I'm just wondering if there's any, um, any advice, any last words, any kind of things that you're like, you just really want to share that we haven't already covered in this conversation? Um, I guess it would be like, to really, um, you know, take it seriously about the energy management to really get good at boundaries, learn to say no. Um, do you, I teach energy management practices literally like how to ground, clear, protect, shield. And I, I find there that I use a breath based meditation visualization thing. Um, but I find those like my, the fun, even though I've been doing this for a long time, the fundamental things that I come back to over and over again, am I managing my energy? Did what, Am I a sponge today or do I have an actually discrete boundary? Am I managing my emotional state? You know, am I, I work every day t- on the daily to manage and release my own emotions. And then I work with other people too when I need them, you know, and, and when I do those things, I feel like I'm on my game. I, I do. And am I doing the self-care? Am I taking the time to fill my own energy tank? Because giving from an empty cup is, well, sort of lead you down a dark spiral you know Mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. so i'm very very diligent about those things because i i have to do them to stay in my power to stay in my in in my groove um so there's a bit a bit of no compromising um on for me on those things and when i then when i do i'm able to stand more in that um in that empowered place. And that's what I want. That's what I want for all of you, all of, all of the empaths in the world is to figure out um, how to be, how to take care of themselves in a way where we can, we can shine because the world needs us. We came here on purpose. I believe during this time to swing the, the evolution of humanity a little more towards the light. Um, And may it be so, you know, and it will be more so if we are, if we're on top of our game. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and we can make a difference when we are on top of our game in a way that when we are, you know, I mean, when we're just thinking about trauma and if we are hijacked, emotionally hijacked, then we've got blinders on and we can't see all the options and we react instead of respond and we are just not effective. And it's like we have to be regulated. We have to be ground. We we must be in an optimal place to truly be part of the solution. Yes. So everything you are saying, I am I am just loving <laughs> everything you are saying. It is so good. Like I said, I could absolutely have have hours of conversation with you because it just sounds like you and I have been like ticking off the boxes and yes, like you know, I think we were separated at birth. I know I, <laughs> you know, I yeah, said I read pretty, your biography and I was like, wow, like yeah, no, it's so pretty many crossovers. <laughs> how many cl- crossovers there are. I mean, even going to, you know, the fact that you and I both spent time at Andover Newton is pretty amazing. Uh, yeah. So how can people find you, Lisa? So LisaCampion.com is my website. I'd love it if you stop by and visit. I actually have a get a gift for everyone who's listening and there's um on my website a free four-hour video class about how to manage your sensitivity if you're an empath and it, it covers these foundational energy management practices that i talk about um there's one class on energy vampires and um one class on relationships and setting boundaries and saying no but i think the really key thing are these foundational um ground clear protect um, practices that I think are a game changer there. You do it, you feel better instantly, mm-hmm. like five seconds after you do it and to do it through the day between clients, before you go into the store, whatever, you know, after you come out of the store, what it's, that's a game changer for me and for lots of the people I work with. So I'd love for you to come by my website and, and get that free gift and uh, check out my book, Energy Healing for Empaths. It's got a lot of 
um, you know, all the things we talked about and more um, in there. So let's. Awesome. And I will have you guys, if you go to the show notes, you will find a link for Lisa's website, lisacampion.com. Also, I will have links for the books as well. And just saying for full disclosure, I will use my Amazon affiliate links for that. So, you know, I will, you guys will help give me a couple pennies that will go towards <laughs> like my crystal addiction. Um, <laughs> but if anybody's been an Amazon affiliate, you understand that like you literally get pennies on <laughs> the dollar or not even the dollar on the multi dollars but um lisa it has been so good to have this conversation with you thank you so much for being so real for being so candid for being so just and for shining your light in this world we are what a gift you are i am so glad you are here on this planet and that you are speaking the truth and that you are teaching other people how to do this work it just I'm just go you. Well, right back at you, sister. Like, I so appreciate the work you're doing and bringing all of this information to your audience and all the, the beautiful books you have and the work you've done. So, thank you, too. Mm, thank you. Yay. As we come to the end of this episode, I'd love to hear what you're taking from this show. Please jump over to empathicmasteryshow.com to leave your comments. In the show notes, you'll find a link to grab your copy of My Empathic Safety Guide, Three Basics for Finding Calm in the Eye of the Storm. And while you're there, please subscribe and follow this show. And thank you for your help sharing this show with the people who need it. Please help me to spread the word and send this podcast to friends or family members who need support living as highly sensitive empathic people. Then join me again when the next Empathic Mastery Show airs. Okay, one last time, hop over to EmpathicMasteryShow.com for your empathic safety guide. And until next show, shine on. We need you and your gifts here on this planet. So please don't judge your empathic rainbow by colorblind standards.